Hi, everyone. This is Terry Klein with the National MPS Society. Um, we have the privilege of having Dr. Heather Lau, a neurogeneticist from in the Lysosomal Storage Disease Department at uh, New York University Lagone, who's going to be speaking to us today about COVID-19 and MPS concerns. Um, for those of you um, that are joining us, thank you for submitting your questions. We have over 93 people that have signed up for the webinar today. Um, and we are going to ask Dr. Lau the questions after she provides us a general overview. If you have any other desired questions you'd like to ask, we ask that you use the chat feature down at the bottom and, and put your questions to that chat feature and we will triage those questions accordingly. Um, thank you, Dr. Lau, first of all, for joining us today. I know how very busy you are um, and you're in just a hot spot in our country and we recognize that. Um, and as you know, with our patient population, we've been fielding a tremendous amount of questions and emails um, with concern from our parents. And even um, today, I want you to know, we do have other stakeholders that are on the call with us um, from industry, as well as some of the researchers in our scientific advisory board. So thank you, Dr. Lau, for, for joining in and, and, and allowing us to host this with you today. Thank you, Terry. I really appreciate this uh, uh, forum or platform to talk a little bit about my experience in COVID-19 in New York City with our uh, mucopolysaccharidosis patients and other lysosomal storage. So um, briefly, I would just go over a little bit of an um, overview, but then I really want to delve into the particular questions that this community has. And as you know, I've put out a few informational webinars um, that are heavy on the science and, 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 and the symptoms of COVID-19 as it affects each lysosomal storage disorder. But just briefly, I just want to go over to set the scene for today that COVID-19 is an important new pathogen that's been um, uh, spreading across the world. And here in New York City, we've been particularly hit hard over the last few weeks, starting in actually going back to February, if you think about it. And over these past several weeks, um, my team and I have started to mobilize to get a message out to say, how do we deal with uh, COVID-19 infection in our patients with MPS? Um, this is a novel virus, meaning that it's never been before seen in the human population. And we're studying this in real time. Our colleagues who um, first saw this in Wuhan in China uh, learning about their experience and then trying to understand the Italian experience in the other European countries. And now, um, as it hit you, the U.S., where we're having a huge amount of infections in the, United, in, in the New York City area, hopefully I can give you some insight into what's happening as it affects your community. So just quickly, this novel virus, why is it so serious? It's because we have no immunity to it. It's hit the human population and we've never seen it before. That means our memory cells, our immune system is not prepared for this. And so as it starts to infect a, a community, it spreads very rapidly because we don't have herd immunity, which is what we rely on with our other um, communicable diseases for which we have vaccines. We want people around us who are immune to it so it, it prevents the spread. So that's one way that it's very serious. And the other way is that once it hits a person, even though over 90% may have a mild or moderate course, there are percent that go on to be hospitalized. And then a smaller percent that have such severe complication that leads to mechanical ventilation and in certain cases more um, actually uh, death. So it, it is very important as we in real time have this disease affecting our community, understand how to stratify, how to risk stratify the patients. Who is at more risk? Who's at mild risk? Um, who, and, and, and how to manage those patients. We don't have any FDA approved therapies for this disease. So we are, again, using medications off label that have other side effect profiles that could interact with the disease, um, the underlying disease, and with medications. So we are trying to act in the best way. We first want to do no harm. That's a primo non nocere, which is a, a tenant in, um, in, in medicine, is we don't want to do harm to our patients, and we want to try to help and treat them. And so um, just quickly, the first few symptoms you know, that we hear about are fever, dry cough, and fatigue. And initial symptoms can be mistaken for cold, allergies, or the flu. But what, as we're learning more about this disease, it manifests differently and to varying severity in various patients. 
We can see muscle aches and pains. We can see sore throat. We can even see a productive cough. We can see headache, chills, uh, nasal congestion. Um, and then we're actually seeing some GI symptoms, maybe even preceding fever and cough, such as abdominal discomfort and loose stools. And finally, um, what's interesting in the neurologic um, uh, part of this is that we are seeing some anosmia. So some patients will start off with a lack or loss of sense of uh, smell or even a loss of the sense of taste. And that's very interesting in heralding uh, potentially the early, the first signs of COVID-19 infection. And then a small percent will go on to severe disease. And the big part of that severe complication is called ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that's um, a significant decline in respiratory function due to this inflammatory response. And that manifests differently um, uh, in, from pneumonia, just simple pneumonia. We can get a pneumonia from, um, from this, and then this goes on to this fluid buildup in our lungs to prevent oxygenation. And this is where we're seeing the need for mechanical ventilation and intubation to manage and try to get oxygen to the lungs, to the bloodstream, to our vital organs. So I'll pause there because that's where, you know, we see the infection start and it progresses over two weeks and some will go on, only some will go on to pneumonia and then to ARDS. And then the complications of ARDS can be multisystemic. So you can imagine in mucopolysaccharidosis as a general group um, that have multisystemic dysfunction, this disease can affect our patients because they have cardiovascular complications already at baseline. They have pulmonary issues, including sleep apnea and, and reduced pulmonary function. They have um, neurologic complications as well. So it's very important that we understand how um, COVID-19 impacts our patients with MPS and how can we protect our patients and also how can we maintain or um, continue therapy during this pandemic. So I'm going to pause there. That was a few minute overview. And Terry, you can start with some questions. Thank you. I think you've probably touched on some of it, but obviously in this list of questions really is, they're really trying to wonder what their true risk is for the kids with MPS, because we've done an overview with the COVID-19 risks and you've kind of parlayed it, but can you parlay it a little more over directly these MPS kids? Absolutely. And what those symptoms are that we really should be zeroing in on. Right, and so when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking both neuronopathic and non-neuronopathic MPS, because as we know, um, the systemic disease in both uh, the neuronopathic and non-neuronopath can be substantial. Yes, the San Filippo have some milder systemic effects, but right now, how are we stratifying risk? Again, we haven't studied our MPS population. I'm opening up a study to look at COVID-19 in our MPS, but this is not yet done. This is real time. So. We are erring on the side to stratify our MPS patients as higher risk. Um, if we look at just the general population, age, um, comorbid diabetes, cardiovascular disease, including hypertension, and pulmonary disease such as COPD and asthma, all raise the risk of the average person without a rare disease. So that is why um, I think when we think about our MPS patients, um, our MPS patients are already struggling with respiratory issues. Um, they have at baseline restriction on pulmonary function tests, if we can measure it. A lot of our patients have obstructive sleep apnea, and they have a need for CPAP or BiPAP. Um, and so they might be at more risk of recurrent infections, especially with their ear infections. And of course, in our MPS patients, they are known to be a difficult airway. Their, their um, ability to intubate is very difficult. And this all needs to be highlighted if they get exposed. Um, and so that we can appropriately uh, care for these patients. Cardiac dysfunction, I am seeing in adults. Again, this is hard because our children are with MPS, are they at increased risk? They, their, their age favors a decreased risk, but their underlying disease is what's stratifying them as, as a higher risk. So if they are already showing signs of thickening of their valves or um, cardiomyopathy, that would put them at an increased risk theoretically. We are seeing in our adult patients um, inflammation of the myocardium or inflammation of the heart called myocarditis. And then we're seeing, we are seeing unfortunately in older patients sudden cardiac death. Will this happen in our younger patients? I'm not sure. I take care of adults with MPS, attenuated MPS too, 
And so I'm stratifying them as a higher risk and making sure that we, we treat them accord, accordingly. Um, neurologically speaking, some of our patients suffer from either hydrocephalus um, or uh, seizures. And with any febrile illness, whenever we talk to our patients about getting a febrile illness, they are at a lower uh, threshold to have seizures break through. And so we have to be very vigilant in our patients that have a history of seizures and our patients that have never had a seizure but do have neuropathic MPS, we have to be on the lookout for seizures. Uh, again, this is just as a neurologist in this field, we're always um, vigilant about um, aggressively treating and looking, looking for and treating seizures. Other parts of COVID-19 which are interesting but could be, uh, may or may not be affected is that COVID-19 can affect your liver and spleen. We are seeing elevated enzymes um, suggesting liver damage and, they, and that foretells a worse outcome. And so we have to make sure that the liver is functioning well. Some of our patients have residual uh, enlargement of their liver and spleen, but, but their function has been normal. But again, we just need to take that into consideration if they get uh, COVID-19 and we start to see a bump in their, um, their liver function test. So it's kind of, it's very complex for our patients but that's why I think it has to be a doctor to doctor conversation. If you are affected with COVID, you're gonna tell your MPS doctor and you're gonna tell your treating physician if you present to the hospital and then they should connect to talk about this. I don't want you to have to remember all of this, but to know that COVID-19 is affecting the heart, the, the, not just the lungs, it's affecting the heart, the liver, it's affecting the kidneys historically our MPS patients do not have kidney disease, but this is one more organ that could be affected um, because of COVID-19. We are seeing some conjunctivitis, we're seeing some skin rashes that are less um, you know, uh, dangerous, but still could be uh, manifesting of COVID-19. So I'll pause there um, and we can go into further questions. Well, one of the follow-up questions I, I have then, it, it really sounds like of obviously families need to really understand their own child and, and the adult needs to understand their own case. What is their baseline? What is their baseline? What, how is their health before this happens so that they know when a tipping point might be taking place and they may have been exposed? Because yes. it could be very different with each child, just like MPS is very different. Yeah. I mean, so if you think about this, this... COVID-19 is no longer, I guess, rare, right? But it started, it, it, it acts like a rare disease because we don't know anything about it. And so doctors are, are trying to deal with patients in real time on how to treat COVID-19. Now add to it a rare disease where you and I know all about MPS, but the frontline workers who are, who are volunteering to help, they don't know necessarily about MPS. Even the best institutions right now, we have all hands on deck. And so when a patient presents with MPS, that should be a red flag. For example, in my hospital, every MPS patient has a red flag, literally a red flag on their chart to say they're a difficult airway, they are, they are complicated, call me. And so we need to have advocates for yourself, for your child, and have your MPS doctor advocating because they may not understand how to treat um, the child or the adult. So one of the questions, right, are the hospitals equipped and trained to apply respiratory support? So we actually tell our patients, right, when we're thinking about any kind of surgical procedure or even a minor procedure where there needs to be sedation, such as um, dental work, um, a simple um, surgical procedure, still needs to be in a tertiary care center that has experience with MPS because of the difficult intubation and because of the airway. Um, so we already want our patients to present somewhere where they know about MPS so that they know to stabilize the spine and not hyperextend so they know how to navigate. And now you add to this in New York City. Now this might be different by you. It may not be such a surge of admissions, but here at NYU, what, what made me concerned was that patients are coming in droves to the ER and they're very sick and they need to act quickly. So. Our MPS patients have been through this before. They know that they need to have a specialized uh, person who's experienced with difficult airways. And that's the first thing you should say because this is a respiratory illness. And if you're having difficulty breathing, we're not gonna have you sit at home like other people. You might actually you would talk to your doctor at the first sign and symptom of COVID-19 and talk about when, 
when do you go to the emergency room? We don't want you showing up there immediately because you could get exposed and we don't want you exposed, but you need to talk about what are the signs and symptoms to bring you to the ER. And then when you get to the ER, the first thing you do is raise your hand and say, I have MPS or my child has MPS and they're a difficult airway. So if they need further airway support, they have the right people there. Um, the ENT doctor, the anesthesiologist who's volunteering at the front lines. We have it here at NYU and they are. I mean, we, it is possible to get appropriate care, but I would just be proactive. Um, and the respiratory support is the same, the, the machine is the same, it's just the actual intubation that um, requires uh, the, um, the expertise and, and the approach to it. I see a question about small chest and skeletal structures, again, um, you know, we treat our patients by their, their weight and their size. And so I think they'd be able to, in real time, understand how to uh, adjust their approach. Unfortunately, we are seeing pediatric cases with, um, with uh, ARDS and with COVID-19. So, um, and in the, in the pediatric ICU, we're very familiar with how to ventilate children or small adults. So that's not the issue. The issue is how do we make sure that they're intubated appropriately. Okay. Next question, or I'll be led by you. The one thing I thought would be important to address um, at this point is how you know, hospitals across the country are, are, are actually possibly delivering treatment to those um, exposed to COVID-19 differently. And within each region that a family may live, they really need to contact their, their first responders or the hospitals to know where they should go um, if they need to be admitted because, because people are changing their hospital priorities around, you know. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so, um, so that was one of my concerns is that maybe one of my patients wouldn't end up at my facility. I'm fortunate to work in, um, you know, in the New York City area where there's other MPS um, experts and people familiar with lysosomal storage disorders but you might end up at a community hospital uh, wherever um, you might be diverted. And it's important that um, I would have, and I've done this before, call ahead to the emergency room. Um, I do this in, in, outside of the pandemic. Say we have a, a, an emergency with one of our patients and they're traveling or they're outside the New York City area. So they know, my patients know to call. And if they don't know, they should know, um, to call us and, um, and get, uh, get the doctor to talk to us and, and, and explain. I, I don't want to put the burden on you per se because you're going to be frightened, you're going to be sick. You yourself might be sick if you're an affected adult or your child might be sick and you're trying to deal with that, um, the shortness of breath. So I would either have like a brief um, letter, if um, ask your doctor to draft that if and when you get sick or just hand them the phone number. I've, I'm on perpetual call right now because I'm concerned that something could happen and I need to explain to the emergency room physician what is MPS in like three minutes or less and understand what do we have to worry about. We have to worry about airway and the difficult intubation. We need to know but baseline pulmonary function, baseline cardiovascular function. And you'll see in certain institutions we have experimental protocols as I said before, we don't have disease modifying therapy. We don't have a cure for COVID-19, but we're trying different drugs right now. And we don't have good data. We have some case series anecdotal reports that are not well controlled, but it's important information that we've received from Wuhan and Italy, and even here in the United States. Do we use hydroxychloroquine? That has a lot of cardiotoxicity you would wanna pause and think about that before you administer that to an MPS patient. You need to know what the EKG looks like. Again, this is very medical oriented um, information that you, the patient may not be able to ask. So that's why you need to get your doctor on the phone and say, hey, um, they wanna give me this medicine. Is this okay for me? Azithromycin might be fine. Does it work? We don't know. Um, there are some experimental um, interleukin inhibitors uh, antiretrovirals being used. Again, the doctor needs to know your current list of medications and your current list of medical problems. And if you can ask your doctor to print it out for you and you have it there or it's on your, on your um, little app for your hospital or maybe it's, it's, it's being able to talk to you. But if you get diverted to a hospital that doesn't know you, you need to get that information across. Because 
again, hydroxychloroquine, we don't know if it's working. They're doing it earlier in the disease course. Um, the data is coming out and it's very toxic and it's not appropriate for a lot of patients. So that's where um, it's important to connect yourself with, you know, the treating MPS provider. You know, that ties into one of the questions that said, you know, what documentation material should patients take mm -hmm. with them if going to the hospital with COVID symptoms? And so yeah. I think we touched on that a little bit, if you have anything else to add. Sure. I kind of talk about like this to-go bag with people. Um, and I do it actually with my family and friends, anybody. It doesn't have to be just someone with a rare disease. Um, the to-go bag. So do you have to do it right now? No. If you're exposed and you start to have symptoms, you're self-monitoring yourself and your family. You're looking for fever. You're looking for cough. You're looking for loss of smell. Again, if, you're, if your child is nonverbal, that's going to be difficult, but you're looking for difficulty breathing, you know, uh, rapid breathing, all these signs and symptoms, and you're going to call early and, and not wait to call the emergency room, right? So if you start to have signs and symptoms, symptoms um, suspicious of COVID, create the to-go bag because we start out mild and then around day five, don't hold me to this, everyone's a little different, but towards five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days, you start to see worsening before you could see a recovery. And so during that time, um, I even personally, we had a to-go bag for our patients. So um, a list of your updated medications, printed out or at least on your phone, phone and chargers, right? And then a list of your, your medical comorbidities. What does that mean? What is your, you have valvular stenosis, which valve? You have some uh, BiPAP, CPAP, what are your settings? Um, all of that information be, could be gotten from your doctor, your last pulmonary, you could just even print out your last pulmonary visit, your last echo, EKGs, just have a little bit either accessible on your app or in a, in a letter. Um, in that bag, I'd also put, um, unfortunately, healthcare uh, directives, advanced directives if you are an adult and make sure you have a designated healthcare proxy. God forbid you're um, sedated and you can't speak for yourself, a list of contacts. Who's the primary contact? We have this wonderful thing here that we instituted um, at NYU. Because we are not allowing adult patients to have a visitor uh, with them in the emergency room and then admitted, which is very isolating and very scary, um, you know, you're allowed to interact with your family members through virtual media, you know, for through uh, phone and iPad. But um, we pair up a doctor with each patient, a virtual doctor who will sit on rounds every day and communicate to the family what's happening with the patient. Not all hospitals are doing this, but I just want to paint this picture to you that um, if you're admitted, um, you, you're not going to have someone there to talk for you. So if you have to be sedated, uh, we want that information. We want the contact information of your closest contact, your healthcare proxy, and of course your MPS doctor, okay? Thank you for that. That's really, really quite helpful. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, those that are having ongoing treatments and what does that look like? This is a whole other area that has a lot of concern for families and, and how they, how they get treatments. And so what are some thoughts around that um, home infusions versus going to hospitals? And I realized that sometimes within the state, it's, it's already directing us into what direction we, they can go. But can you talk to families about their therapy options and how they get infusions? Right, so ideally we would not halt infusions during this time. We want you to get your infusion um, because we do see that when patients are off of their therapy, they start to have you know, uh, fatigue, or they could potentially worsen their pulmonary function, maybe not so dramatically initially. Um, but it is important to try to maintain the infusions. Now, this is an individualized discussion between the patient or the family and the doctor. And I can't give you a blanket recommendation, but some things to think about. So the thoughts um, that came across our, um, you know, institution four weeks ago was the following. Is your infusion center um, exclusively using nurses, using nurses that are exclusively just infusing patients, um, or are they going over and working in the COVID ER? Are they redeployed? We had some, um, we have a shortage of healthcare workers, and we have some fantastic nurses that are volunteering, um, which is a wonderful endeavor, but 
are, do we have nurses that are protected, that are not being exposed to COVID, working in your, um, either in your infusion center or even in your nursing agency? So as a provider, I worked with pharmaceutical companies and my um, pharmacy and the nursing agencies, and we took a poll as to, do we have enough nurses and are the nurses protected? Are the nurses now using PPE? What is PPE? Personal protective equipment. Um, we did have a shortage just even in the hospitals, working with COVID patients, we had to reuse. And, and so um, it was concerning whether or not uh, people outside of the hospital setting would have access to it. And now as we're ramping up, we're understanding more and we're getting more PPE, I'm recommending and our nursing agencies are recommending that uh, the nurses are using proper masks and of course they use gloves and, and gowns and they can uh, switch that out between patients. Is that absolute? No, but it's a, another risk reduction. So if you're comfortable that the nurse is not seeing active COVID patients, that's good. Number two, well, what about the fact that they're infusing other patients and we don't know if they're uh, um, exposed. They should be changing PPE between, do not reuse the gown, do not. Um, you know, they're gonna change the gloves. And, um, and then before the visit, whether it's at a center or at a home visit, um, have, a, have that phone call between patient and family and the nurse. And you both mutually screen each other. Anyone in the household with fever, cough, or suspicious symptoms or exposure? Is the nurse um, exposed because of her own family or other patients? And then you decide what to do from there, whether to halt the infusion and, and do quarantine. So that's something that I can empower the patient and the family is you have every right to ask your nurse about that and demand PPE use. For yourself, while you're going through the infusion, consider wearing a mask yourself. Again, more of that mask is about preventing exposure to the nurse, but there is some reduction in that. And if our children, um, it's very hard with children to uh, prevent them touching themselves, uh, especially if they're um, uh, having any intellectual dis disability or cognitive impairment. Um, so the idea would be to protect everyone around that patient, make sure everyone's washing their hands, using hand sanitizer, and then have the nurse, sometimes these infusions last four hours, have the nurse separate. One of my patients has the nurse sit in the kitchen and he sits in the living room, so they're not constantly um, engaged with each other. But you're right, every time we have someone come into the home or our patient is traveling to a center, there's a potential for exposure. So you really need to talk to your physician about um, the, uh, the level of risk. And you know, it could also be because your community is hitting the apex, this, this, this height of infections, you might hold it during that heightened um, uh, stage. But it's really important to talk individually about your risk. Yeah, it sounds like, um, you know, with, with many things with MPS, you have to be your child's best advocate. And it's important that you are pre-qualifying the caregiving or, or the ancillary caregivers that are coming into your home. You need to be able to pre-qualify them before they come in the door. And it is okay to be asking these questions. So be empowered to do that for yourself as an adult or for your child. And yeah, like this is no time to sit back and be polite in a way, you know, this is, and I think, I think the nursing agencies are hearing us, but when it first happened, and it, the same thing happened at the hospital, I'm not going to fault any agency about not using PPE, initial guidance was very unclear, and so we're wearing, don't wear masks, wear masks. But it also depends on how, um, how much of the contagion, you know, how spread is it within the community. Here in New York, I mean, we have a shelter in place and outside we're all wearing masks at all the time. So um, it might be different in your community. It might not have hit as hard, but as soon as you have one case, you're gonna find it double and triple very quickly if we don't take these precautions. So definitely be your patient, your, your uh, child's advocate or your self-advocate. Outside of the, the social distancing um, and um, some of the other remaining isolated recommendations for importance, are there, other, are there any other things that you would have us consider um, with our kids or adults with MPS and ML, what we should be doing? Can you think of any other precautions besides that social distancing and isolation? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's just common sense. It's, it's you know, self-isolating within your own household. 
Um, and if you need to go out, it depends on the height of everything. And, and we're going to see how we can return to society. I'm not sure yet. But right now, it is you know, taking precautions, limiting the people going to the food store, to the grocery store. It doesn't need to be a whole family affair. One person goes out one and comes back in using a mask and gloves, if you use gloves, but you have to use it appropriately, uh, washing hands. Um, it's sadly, we, we cannot congregate as families. Um, even if we're social isolating between households, um, it's, it's a risk. So I think the basic precautions right now are pretty stringent, um, sh shelter in place. If you need to go out and into the community, wear a mask, wash your hands. If you choose to wear gloves, and now if you're a child, this is very hard. Gloves are not gonna work. As soon as you touch something, they're contaminated. And if you touch your face, that's it. The transmission of this is, is from touching a contaminated surface and touching your face, eyes, mouth, and nose, or if someone sneezes or coughs or really breathes hev heavily in your, um, close to you. So it's really hard for our children. And so we can't have these children in school right now. They can't be congregating. So those are the main um, tenants. Uh, I'm not, you know, again, if there's any specific questions I can answer, but those are the most important. And as we return or try to return back to work or school, you know, I think um, the role of a vaccine and the role of immunity is going to be an important determining factor of who can go back and when. You know, one other question that, that had come up in my thoughts in this as well is that um, we obviously, Heather, have families are being diagnosed right now. They're, they're being diagnosed right now in, in the middle of this COVID-19. And we did have a special support session with some of those families. But I, I know that wasn't on the list of things that we had talked about, but we have families being diagnosed every week with MPS and they're in COVID-19 and they have to make some decisions about seeing some specialty doctors perhaps or, or the infusion or even perhaps a transplant. What, is there anything that you can say to that situation because they are doubly devastated right now? Yeah, this is really difficult to, to be um, acutely diagnosed with a rare disease. Fortunately, we have a wonderful support system in, in the MP Society, but you're absolutely right. You need to delineate the disease burden when someone is diagnosed to understand um, what we're dealing with and how severe. So the initial, um, as, as you can see, that most of the healthcare workers are converting to telemed visits. And so the advice would be to start there. Um, initially, it's a lot of information that needs to be communicated to the families through the doctor. So I'm offering telemed visits as I'm, um, you know, uh, I was initially volunteering at the hospital and now able to do telemed visits for urgent questions and concerns. And then it's a case by case. There are, um, you know, I'm gonna say from our community, from our hospital system, we are seeing patients in person if needed, but it's a very protective environment and it's very um, specific. So uh, especially with our MPS patients, we just discharge someone, we need to see them physically. We need to do a trach change. So even if they're diagnosed initially, or they have ongoing needs. Um, so I will just say what our in university is doing. So we have limited staff. We have everyone is in PPE. We are screening the patient. And if they need to be seen in person, they come in, very carefully come in and do the assessments we need to be done. If we need to do an EKG and echocardiogram, if we need to do pulmonary function tests, if it's, you know, unless it's can be put off. So it's really a combined effort of triaging and risk reduction uh, because it is important to understand the disease burden and then to initiate therapy. We still are doing that. So our infusion centers are exclusively nurses that are only working with our patients. Uh, we are using PPE and we are, we are going on with infusions. We are um, hopefully uh, either the patients traveling to us by private car or we're asking for car service through Medicaid and other um, organizations. So yes, especially if you're diagnosed with say a hurler under the age of two and you need transplant, you're gonna reach out to a transplant unit and they will make accommodations because we can't delay certain therapies. We cannot delay certain interventions. So it's, um, it's all about risk reduction, but we can't be zero risk. Uh, and, and 
you know, for my patients that are just overdue by a month or so, I'll say, let's wait on the pulmonary exam. Let's wait on the cardio, you know, the echocardiogram. But, um, you know, I would say talk to your provider, do a telemed visit, and then start to stratify which, which, what, which assessments are critical right now and which can be delayed. Thanks. Um, one other thing. Thank you for that. It's really a, a tough environment um, all the way around um, when you're getting newly diagnosed, and this is just making it so hard. Um, ben, you, you've touched on this a little bit, but a lot of families have this ongoing regimen of doctor's appointments, and some of them are critical. And so they're kind of looking at when, when, when do we know it's okay to return back to our regular doctor appointments and is it really just going to be state by state because of how you know the impact of the COVID is and what their governors are saying should they just be postponing some of these appointments unless they're life-threatening I mean they're looking for some guidance yeah. outside of MPS when will it be safe for them it's really hard to know and that's why I think uh, I'm just so happy that we were able to institute telemed immediately there were so many restrictions and the government uh, uh, actually uh, made it more lenient to and allowed us to do this so that you can talk to a cardiologist and talk. They should look at your baseline. They should look at your last assessment. And then it's a shared decision, a risk, you know, risk benefit assessment of when and how long to defer that appointment. Um, it does depend on the community. Um, so we're hitting our apex here. And that doesn't mean it's over, actually. I, I'm very glad to hear that we're down on number of admissions and, and infections and intubations, but we are heaving. We are continuing at a very high level of a high capacity. So we're gonna roll out personally, you know, not right away, but start to try to roll out inpatient visits again. It really depends on your local state. It can't be a unified, we're all back online now. You have to look at your community, look at how it's affecting your community. There are pockets where there's not a lot of infections and that's good, but we don't also want to promote the infection. So there's no good one response. It's look at your particular situation. How long has it been? Um, if you're hitting that apex, like right now, Long Island, New Jersey, Connecticut are kind of climbing. So, you know, what I did a few weeks ago was I said, you know, these three weeks where we're gonna really get hit, let's pause a little bit and see if we can defer some appointments. Um, and it's, you really need to do it carefully with, with the doctor. And they, they're starting to become savvy about when they can. We had a case where our, our MPS patient really needed to see the ENT. We had drainage. We did not want that to progress. Started with a televisit. They triaged it, tried some drops and antibiotics. It persisted. Then it led to an in-person visit. We are here for you. We, we can see you, but we need to make it um, very selected and very careful. And as the rate of infections goes down and we start to see a slow return, that would be important. What I'm waiting for as a healthcare worker is um, immunity testing to see if, you know, those of us who have been exposed, do we have immunity to it? Can we feel like we can safely interact with patients? Um, and then obviously the vaccine development, which is very, it's unfortunately several, it's, it's a far time off. So we can't halt all our doctor's appointments for another year. Um, but you can talk to each doctor and figure out a safe timeline. Thank you for bringing up the immunity testing. That is yeah. the beginning of some of the emails that I'm starting to receive mm -hmm. from families, mainly because a few of our, <clears throat> a few of our families um, and in our family directly um, believe that we have been exposed to COVID-19 and we've gone through it before a test was even available. And so we're, we're waiting for those immunity tests. I'm sure they must be going to the first responders. Do you have any other information about when it might be available to the yeah. general public? Well, I, th I don't think it's a big secret. So it is definitely being rolled out, just like the diagnostic testing took time to ramp up. It was very frustrating. And I'll personally say as a you know, healthcare worker, we didn't have access to testing unless um, we had specific criteria initially. And that criteria loosened, unfortunately, as, the, as it spread through the community. So right now in New York City, right, the, um, the access to antibody testing is a couple different routes. Um, we do see in Long Island some, uh, some efforts towards the first responders, the EMTs, the police and the fire um, uh, department. And then in New York City, we're slowing, we, we're, we're not seeing it initially yet, we're seeing it in research. So if we had a known COVID positive patient who's recovered more than a few weeks out 
there are research trials that are looking for donation of plasma. So it's a double edge. It's looking for antibodies and then plasma donation. That's one way. Um, the antibodies are uh, the antibody testing is becoming validated, and 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 it's 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 getting um, the problem is not so much validation. It's ramping it up to uh, massive testing. And I think I'm hopeful over the next few weeks we're going to start to see it unfold, just like the diagnostic testing. In a matter of three weeks, it went from healthcare workers couldn't get access to it unless they had the three criteria. And now we're testing all the healthcare workers um, yeah. comes up. So we're going to see more and more because that's the way, that's how the president and Cole, everyone's talking about how do we stratify risk and how do we allow people to go back. So more, um, I think we're going to get updates every few days, new information. And I'm very hopeful to have um, increased access to that antibody testing because we're going to need it. We need it to make decisions. You know, it's important too, um, with you saying that, that we're just in this space where every day it's a different dialogue. Every day, I don't, I don't know anything that we've gone through that's been every day we're in a different dialogue for the past 30 days. I know. I, I it's just um, what I've learned so much in, in the past few weeks and then um, just watching and seeing this unfold, we're learning about the disease, we're learning about um, how to test it, how to track it, what's the best way to contain it mitigate it. It's, um, you know, even the webinar that I gave uh, this past week, it might be obsolete in another week or not completely, but new information is being gathered every day. And I must say, it's, it's wonderful to work collaboratively across institutions with other um, uh, lysosomal experts to understand this and to try to get more information in real time so that we are helping people immediately. Well, that webinar that you've talked about, we'll have it up on our website today, Heather, but um, Dr. Lau, I'm sorry, Dr. Lau. That's okay. <laughs> I think we got casual because we're at home for a minute, but Dr. <laughs> Lau put together a, a wonderful webinar, so we'll make sure that we push that out on our website as well as on our social media platform so those can um, watch that, and we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. I want to open it up to just Leslie for a minute. I don't know if there were any other chat questions, Leslie, or anything that you thought of during this conversation you'd like to ask Dr. Lau. Yes, I've gotten a couple of messages and emails and different things that have come in. Um, one of them, I've gotten a few questions regarding the transfer of the virus and some of the, um, what might be some of the basics regarding the length of time oh. we're seeing that it's remaining on surfaces, um, solid surfaces, particularly in a hospital setting that might be on shared equipment, such as x-ray machines or pulse oxes. Do, um, do our families need to be concerned about this? Uh, if you could speak to speak to some, yeah. some about the transmission. Sure, so transmission is um, via the droplets, right, through the cough and the sneeze, and maybe, you know, there's that question of is it airborne or not? It kind of lingers in the air before it drops. But then the other most important, probably more importantly, is that it lingers on fomites. So what are these surfaces? And there are some studies out there that show it can range from 24 hours to three days, and maybe in some nooks and crannies it could last even longer. So um, it's a very real concern from when you're out and about in the community, you're going to the grocery store, um, you're, oops, um, so you're on the grocery store, you're in, um, using the carts and you're wiping, wanting to wipe it down. So here's the thing, in the hospital setting, which for good or for bad, um, you walk around and at least in my hospital setting, uh, we have bleach and we have other wipes constantly in use. So everything is wiped down. And that's why it's kind of frustrating for patients if they need to come in for a non-COVID reason, or if they're co they come in for non-COVID, but they accidentally get swabbed, not accident, they get swabbed and they, whoops, we have COVID because they're asymptomatic. They just use the MRI machine. It's decontaminated. So that's some of the delays. We are decontaminating constantly. So um, you walk into the elevator, you see the streaks of the bleach you smell the bleach, you see it constantly between the pole socks, absolutely, everything is wiped down. If we are in a COVID positive, we're cohorting patients. Right now we're so overrun with COVID that most of the hospital's COVID. Um, but when it started, we had cohorts, COVID positive, COVID negative, and you're absolutely wiping down because it can last for days. We, but this is standard of care. We should always be wiping down with alcohol in between patients, but I think there's extra measures. So certain surfaces, again, there's the study out there that says on cardboard, it's this, it, it's 72 hours on um, certain surfaces. So here's what I wanna make sure you understand though. 
if you're disinfecting it, this is not a spray and wipe kind of thing. Read your Lysol bottle. Read the, the disinfectant wipes. You have to let it sit for two minutes, right? This is not 10 seconds. When you wash your hands, you're washing it with soap and water. Such simple, you don't need heavy duty antibacterial um, alcohol or anything because the lipid in the, in the, in the soap kills it and that vigorous uh, rubbing. But when we think about surface cleaning, um, cleaning surfaces, you have to let that sit for a few minutes. And so that's important to know as well when you're wiping between it. And you know what, you're in the hospital, people can forget, remind them. You're there, Did, was that wiped down? Did you wipe it down? Did you wash your hands? Most of us are taught as healthcare providers to wash our hands in front of the patients. They see it and they, they know it's happening. But you know what? This is the time to empower yourself. Just, I, I wouldn't be offended if you asked me, did you wipe your stethoscope? Did you wipe your hammer? Um, and we are doing it. We have, we have to do it. It's, it's always been done, but now it's more so. You know what, well, but I know you got another question, Leslie, but it just made me think of something else. Has there been any talk at all, um, Dr. Lau, about um, retransmitting, retransmission or resurfacing of COVID-19 in a patient that might have been tested positive? Oh, yeah, I haven't looked. I, honestly, that data is, is, is um, so this is hard because these are lack of peer reviewed articles are coming out. So what does that mean? When, a, when some reports come out before they're published, they're reviewed by, um, by experts in the field to, to kind of debunk it, to ask questions. And, but we want also to get this information out in real time. And so I'm, I'm still kind of uh, uh, cogitating on this or thinking about it. it. Is it a reinfection? Is it re, you know, or is it reactivation of, of it? Is it viral? Just detecting the virus in a sample, does that mean you're infecting? Um, because these are testing viral particles. Are you truly shedding and contagious? We don't know those answers yet. What are those cases popping up in Wuhan? I have to look at that more closely. Um, I hate not to have an answer for you, but it's That's okay. so quickly. So we need to do more research. We do. What else do you have, Leslie? Okay, I have, um, I think this is a good one. Uh, home management versus when to go to the hospital. So we have a population obviously with, um, that have pulse oximeters at home and things like that to be able to measure what are your thresholds for recommendation? Yeah. So again, we're kind of doing a Q&A where we're jumping around a little bit. So thinking about shortness of breath. So, so fever, we've managed fever at home. We, we can manage a little runny nose, a, a dry cough here and there. What you're looking for, and you might do this earlier because our patients may not be verbal, they're children. Um, children tend to be fine, 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 and they crump no matter what, even children without MPS. And so you're looking for difficulty breathing, retractions, and you know, sucking in here in the chest walls, uh, fast breathing. Do not manage that at home. I don't care if the pulse ox is 99 because a child can um, actually uh, continue to be 99 because they're breathing fast. So don't be falsely reassured with a pulse ox that it's 99%, but your child is breathing very fast or their heart rate's very fast. So that's where I get a little concerned about giving blanket recommendations. So, you know, we don't want them to rush to the ER because we don't want to expose them. But on the other hand, this illness, even in, in adults with no underlying issues, can go from doing fine and then within hours decline very rapidly. And so you want to alert your doctor when your child or yourself, you have fever and you have a cough and then start to go through, what do I do? And we don't want we don't want you going late to the ER, okay? Not with our children that have underlying pulmonary issues. So pulse ox is great, but look for the other signs. If your child's nonverbal, they might become irritable and fidgety, right? They are they in pain? Are they having a headache? Are they having a sore throat? Or are they having breathing problems? And so you're going to look for that. Late signs are the bluishness around their mouth. That's a later sign. But we want to look for rapid, shallow breathing. Even before that, you know, if your child says, oh, I can barely keep a conversation, if they can barely talk to you while they're um, explaining a story or they're reading to you, that is a warning sign. It's just like you, if you can't carry a conversation and you're taking deep breaths, you need to go. You need to call your doctor or call 911 and go. Is that helpful? Yeah, very. 
we don't want to wait too late for that. Okay. Anything else, Leslie? I haven't gotten any new ones for the last couple of minutes. So, Dr. Lau, I don't know if you have any other last words um, that you'd like to share with us, um, but I do yeah. want to say um, before you do that, that you just are in, in the thick of things. And I know there's a lot of thick of things around the country and around the world. I, I can't imagine, nobody can, what you're going through. Um, but know that we care for you. Um, we're thankful for your knowledge. We're thankful for the skills that you have. So you can care for all of your New Yorkers, as well as those with MPS and lysosomal diseases. We just really hope that you take care of yourself and um, you stay as healthy as you possibly can because we need you. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm being very careful. Um, and it's, you know, it's just important that the knowledge that I have just from the observations is just shared widely. So you don't have to suffer through what we suffered through here in New York. And, and if you can do anything to prevent um, the surge of admissions and, you know, it is, it is, it's taking its toll on the city. We, we, we have an unprecedented amount of deaths every day. And, and so, although this is very, um, most people recover, most people do fine. When it hits your community hard, like it did in New York City, it just takes our vulnerable, uh, our vulnerable patients. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's been very difficult, but if we have any information that can get this out to you so that you can prevent the exposure, you can take action, you can be proactive, you don't have to feel vulnerable. And at the whim of this disease, um, if you can be empowered by any of these in, this information, um, that would be, I'd be happy just to, you know, to, to have spent this time doing this. Um, and I just want to, one comment is, there's a question, will our kids be treated and cared for as the same as a person who's non-MPS? And I will say as a physician, all my physician colleagues, everybody that walks into that door gets a fair shot, gets a fair chance at the best care possible. And so, you know, there is concern about, you know, when if there's um, so many people needing care, everyone is coming to everyone's aid. And the question is um, just being able to understand the person before us and understanding their rare disease and, um, and trying to do the best for that patient and whatever disease they have. So everyone is treated the same. We do need to risk stratify to understand, you know, not everyone can be admitted and a lot of people are, are at home on oxygen and being monitored because we just don't have the um, capacity. Um, but, you know, it's really important that we understand that we need to risk stratify and it is difficult. And those are difficult uh, discussions for um, whatever age group and whatever comorbidity um, because this disease, when it gets severe, the um, ability to treat this in severe stages for everybody, regardless of of um, comorbidity is difficult. It is difficult once we start to progress to ARDS in any patient. Well, I can't, I can't, it's, it's terrible. And you're doing everything you can to help all of us um, as this unfolds. And from the society, we can't thank you enough for the time that you gave us. We will make the, um, the webinar, as I had mentioned, from Check Rare available so that we can, we can really try to make this as, as viral as we possibly can. If anyone has questions that they are thinking about after this ends, please send them over to Leslie at mpssociety.org. Um, and she will, she will work with Dr. Lau and triage any maybe additional questions that are outstanding there. On behalf of everyone here, Dr. Lau, thank you. And for all of you that decided to join our webinar, I hope that you were able to gain some more information to take back to your families and to your work environments. Um, stay safe, stay self-isolated, stay home if you can. And for our first responders, God bless you. Thank you. No, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful um, to work with everybody. Everyone's doing their best and um, I appreciate this opportunity. And the webinar is a bit heavy on the medical part, but if it's um, helpful to you or share it with your uh, providers and other doctors, but thank you for this, uh, this opportunity. Thanks, Dr. Lau. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye now.